Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Astartes Anonymous podcast. We hope you're having a very, very wonderful holiday season with Christmas coming up in only three days. Three Ooh. days, gentlemen. Yeah, baby. Wow. Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> only three days away. Only three days away. Yes. Wow. Definitely. Only three days away. You where you stand, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a, another very special episode for you today. Well, we're just going to go over some of the more wholesome things who have happened in the setting over the last however many years worth of literature we have received. So I am once again joined by Santa Claus, one of his elves, and what I can only assume is Krampus. How are we doing this evening, gentlemen? <laughs> doing well. Doing really good. I'm just uh, having a good time, you know? Getting back onto the grind of recording. <laughs> we haven't done that in a while now. No, we haven't. We recorded mm. so much stuff in advance that it's kind of... It has has been a while. It has been a while. But now Red's uh, going, or going to be missing for a little bit due to a work thing. It, we're going to be missing him for a, for a few episodes, aren't we? Yes, consider, count yourselves lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute tragedy, that one. <gasps> I'm going to fucking appear in your room when you think I've been gone for months. <laughs> you had your chance last month. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, you clearly didn't see the IED I planted. <laughs> <laughs> just, for, just for reference to anyone who doesn't know, last month we uh, read Aaron and I and a few other regulars in our Discord and people we've known for a while sort of all got together here in England for a little get-together and some games and some some other shenanigans for a week. And uh, it was fun. The guys didn't have to sleep in bath towels this time. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was luxury. It was luxury. The fucked up part was Aaron had the chance to get a fucking air mattress, but instead he chose to sleep on the ground. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> That was pretty cozy, I'll be real. I've got a picture of it, I'm pretty sure. You're pretty you were pretty co you're sleeping on the fucking ground in basically a shed. No. No, it was so much better than that. I had like two duvet covers on the floor, an actual pillow, a bed pillow this time, a sleeping bag, and then I got a really, really cozy blanket and wrapped it inside the sleeping bag with me. And it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. Some of the best sleeps of my life, weirdly enough. Well, I can confirm that Aaron uh, has this weird ability of like just being able to fucking doze off. <laughs> I've, it's 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 really weird. Like while well, whilst I was so not this time around, but like first time around in England, while I was freezing my ass off, uh, Aaron just fucking laid down on that shitty ass air mat mattress and immediately fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> It's my superpower, man. I can sleep yep. anywhere. God, the things yep. I would I would give to have your sleeping pattern at the moment. <laughs> with, oh man, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. Um, um, the only problem um, with it though is it extends to waking you up in the morning because you just you <laughs> fucking suck at that. No, I just left. I I just left the door open to the fucking little <laughs> thing, the little house we were in. <laughs> the, the icy England winds. Icy England. What what are you talking about? It, the the weather was awesome when I went again. It was, yeah. it was so weird. So the the news How and the weather all gold. predicted that that week would be fested with rain and wind and you know overcast skies at absolute best. Um and everywhere red went was just pure sunshine. There's even like two instances I can remember where it was raining. It was actually raining. We could see it. We could see it on the skylights above us, the, 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 the canopy, all the you know, rain hitting the glass and hearing it. And Red stood up and walked over to the French doors and the sun just fucking appeared just behind him. <laughs> it was so fucking... It was so strange. Did you, right? I'm going out. Stood up, parted the fucking sky. Yeah, it's, he's like um, he's like an inverted Moses. It's really bizarre. <laughs> inverted Moses. Yeah. Whoa! Yeah. A thousand years of sunshine upon ye. I got some. I got some good pictures. I'll slap them in the in the chat here of him just looking benevolent because I lost him at the train station. <laughs> and um, literally, so we came back from central London, got into the station, went into this corner store. And I couldn't find this fucking guy anywhere. And I'm looking around for like a good three minutes. Couldn't see him anywhere at all. And then I look outside and I see this guy like puffing a thing of smoke all the way at the end. I'm like, that's him. 
That's my fucking guy I'm looking for. And then... Um, the silhouette of the sun god. If you look at these, I've just like tagged, you can see him just with this halo of sun behind him in this long hallway. It's fucking majestic. I can't lie. <laughs> I couldn't be mad. <laughs> I mean, you, you thought the smoke was uh, him uh, on his vapor, but that's actually him returning to his uh, sun god realm as he's uh, <laughs> evaporating. <laughs> <laughs> We've got fucking Ra over here. Um, yeah. <laughs> Curse of Ra. <laughs> <laughs> Blessing of Ra. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> Anyways, we expected we we do expect this episode to be potentially a slightly longer one, and because it's you know it's our Christmas episode and you know yada yada yada, we are once again skipping the uh, models of the week. But do not worry, we will resume in the new year. There's a bunch of excellent ones in the Discord we do want to show off, so do not worry, um, uh, gentlemen. I mean, before we? before we oh? go, can I make one quick shout out? Of course someone. you can. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, let me retrieve the art piece. One of our, uh, one of our, I think, subscribers, but definitely Discord members, drew a bit of fan art uh, of me and my beloved cat Talos, and I feel like uh, they deserve a shout out for that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. this was oh, great. Yeah, this was awesome. Um, Who did this again? I let me see if I could find it real quick. I can't really <laughs> remember. It wasn't in commission. Oh, there it is. It was by ExoGuy. ExoGuy. Yes, this art piece was done by ExoGuy, who posted it on our Discord. Hasn't really posted anything else that I could see. Uh, but yeah, I fucking love this goddamn piece of art. <laughs> no, it's excellent. No, it's a very oh, snazzy yeah. art style. He completely encapsulated Talos' vacant stare into nothingness. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see like, a side-by-side -side of all the team. That'd be fucking cool. I just love the wonderful um, dichotomy of your character being stood there so menacing and Talos looking borderline innocent until you notice the <laughs> chain around the little bastard. <laughs> that chain is for your protection, not mine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do we have anyone else we need to shout out? I'm pretty sure we do, but I can't remember. Um, I know, Let me once again, see. Steph did some artwork of me and her saying Kurz was a sloppy bitch if you want to post that on the screen <laughs> oh yeah can you oh god I need to go find that That's I got it I got, I got, you. I got oh, you thank you and here's another art piece of Steph another server regular and one of our friends uh, trying to slander my fucking gene father <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Steph's done a, a bunch of really great, great artwork. It's been, it's been a good couple of months <laughs> since we've had the opportunity to show off some of Steph's work, so it's, it's really nice to see mm -hmm. some of that again. Definitely. She's doing this really cool Tyranid Space Marine thing over on Instagram that she's posting. It's probably one, yeah. some of her best work she uh, I, I've seen her do. So if no, you, anyone's curious, uh, I will force Tom to link her Instagram in the fucking <laughs> and and I will I will I will make a note and I will put that link in there. That's wonderful. Good. Well, I think we also need to shout out um, E G M C G. I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> uh, I just call him Iggy. Iggy. Oh. Yeah, that that checks out. Iggy, yes. <laughs> I don't know if we. Uh, I can't remember if we uh, properly... Well, what Iggy has done is Iggy has actually, one by one, and we actually, sh I don't think we showed off any of them, but Iggy has one by one created artwork of all of our avatars, as well mm -hmm. as the avatars for two of our guests, both Alex, um, the um, gaming storyteller, aka the Dutch 40k guy, as well as Chaotic Voices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'll just, I'll put all of those on the screen now. They're I really, really them. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, excellent. I think... My favorite one, I mean, I'm biased. My favorite one's my own, but I think Red's is just amazing. <laughs> Red's is yeah. so fucking visceral and cool, and it really gels well with uh, Iggy's art style. You know, it's just Definitely. Mm, badass. Chef's I can't, excellent stuff, Iggy. This, uh, this art piece he did, uh, this fat art he did, conveys both being fucking tired and being on the verge of a manic attack. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> very lore accurate thank you for, for red and for all of his night lord brethren it's a very thin line between being ready to fall asleep and being ready to murder and this <laughs> captures that you're right it, it captures this wonderfully for sure and he sure as hell caught uh managed to capture my smug yes uh, aura 
but mine. <laughs> I, I haven't seen yours, Luke. I never you haven't? Oh, no, I never saw you. I saw everyone else's. Let me fucking post it then. Here you go. <laughs> Yours looks, yours looks so superiority complex, Moots. It, it really does. <laughs> oh my god. This, <laughs> yeah, that, I don't know about you, IRL, but this depiction of you certainly knows how far we'd have gotten without your artwork. <laughs> Not <in> the graphic <laughs> assets. It looks like that scene from Invincible with Omni Man looking down at the training yeah. board. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. That's great. You, you should never have been born. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I, I like it because it kind of nice. like gives gives off like JoJo vibes. Oh I yeah, like, kind of. Yeah, I, I can see the kanji in the background. That's yeah, my first kind of. That's very JoJo esque. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. Definitely see that. I can definitely also see the that. little art, uh, the little paint dripping off of mm. into uh, onto Iggy's uh, uh, signature. There, nice touch. <laughs> <laughs> that's classy. I like that. Well done. <laughs> so yeah, that's. Uh, on uh, Twitter, Iggy McIggy or Iggy Masiggy. Uh, wonderful work, Iggy. Thank you. Thank you very much. God, I can't wait to see some more, actually. In fact, uh, since we're on the topic, Iggy has done a bunch of Imperial Titan things recently, which mm-hmm. I'll endeavor to go find and post some as well, since we're talking about him with such reverence. And they are amazing. His most recent one he's done at the time of recording shows off uh, a couple of guardsmen looking up at a Warlord Titan, and it is absolutely astonishing it's really really cool see a great work iggy uh, looking forward to seeing some more right gentlemen should we move on to the main topic of today's episode for sure for sure if you feel it so is, confident so <laughs> for the audience today we are talking about some of the more wholesome things to have appeared in the setting this, this isn't going to be like a tier list this isn't going to be particularly well structured it's going to be a little bit abstract but we're just gonna have some fun when with have it we ever been well structured tom that's a good question. True. I do not have an answer yeah. for that. There Half is the an time answer. shit doesn't appear on the screen. <laughs> this One day I won't space get bullied for that. De- degrading not around today, us. Though. You let in a fucking Harlequin last time. You <laughs> fucking dick. And this is the last time I give you the fucking keys while I'm away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Harlequin. Um, the Harlequin was really happy to talk about the phallic connections between different <clears throat> tyrannic bioforms. So that I'm was still interesting. Fucking uh, finding whoopee cushions. I mean, the Harlequin's just a start of... They released you see this toxic literal gas, demon Tom? holding the mic stand right now? <laughs> no, he's just a little guy. You leave mm, my... You, just, you leave Dumpy Grimbo out of this. We haven't told the audience about the little demon holding the mic, have we? We've not actually said anything on a podcast episode about it, have we? We never Wait, will. we haven't? No, we haven't. We've never mentioned him. No. We, we never will. The audience will just stare at him and wonder what his origins are, all right? <laughs> his name is Dumpy Grimbo. Don't forget it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> He that may appear later on, mainly in your room, after <laughs> you're finished yeah. watching this. Be that, aware. That's going to either teleport you or weld your door shut. Those, those are the two options. <laughs> <laughs> he's fucking welder certified, all right? I think he's forklift certified as well, if I recall correctly. He's like, oh, yes. he's yeah. got a few uh, qualifications. But he's um he's qualified to hold a boom mic, too. That's why he actually, that's how he got this job, I'm pretty sure. Oh, Aaron got took into the warp oh, again. Oh, oh. <laughs> God damn it, Aaron. Not again. Not, Not again. again. Not again. No. <laughs> Anyways. God damn it. Uh, let's move on to our main uh, topic of this episode. So the prompt, uh, no real big prompt. We just want to talk about some wholesome stuff. So I will give us the first thing to talk about. And if I recall correctly, this was Moots' suggestion. In fact, I actually think Moots and Red oh did the vast majority of these suggestions. Uh, so they're going to be carrying a lot of this. So the first one. Moots, I we believe... We always carry this fucking show. I know. I know you do. I know you do. That's not lost on me. Don't you worry. Is Rebute Gilliman... Oh, no, this is Red's suggestion. Rebute Gilliman and his mother. No, that was Moots. No, that was my suggestion. You spelt, you spelt mom the American way, so I thought it was Red's. <laughs> the Wait, there's, there's another way to spell mom? Yeah, oh, my God. He, he, yeah, he, he thinks that only the fucking Americans spell it with an O. <laughs> Well, oh, no, because it, when, you, when you don't live in the States and you learn English, you learn either British English or you learn American English. And I didn't realize Moots learned American English. It's the only well, real English. That explains the, the, the poor education on Moots' side. Yes. <laughs> well, th- th- that's, that's funny, actually, because we learn uh, British English, but for, uh, for some reason, mom is always, uh, as far as I can remember, is always oh. taught us to be with M-O-M. Oh, so it's just kind of a, um, a wacky foreign conglomeration of the two. <laughs> I guess Tom got sucked into the warp. 
D- 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 it's not me on. this time. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> oh, yeah. what, are you, what are you talking about? I mean, you just oh, kind okay. of faded out and stopped talking. <laughs> what the fuck's going like, on? I was like, oh no. This is, did, did I cut out? This, is, this is why insane. you don't let a fucking Harlequin on the Space Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> the Geller field's all fucked up. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, right, Moots, talk to us about Rebute Gilliam and his mother, please. Okay, okay, yes. Uh, so, I'll be honest, I have kind of a uh, surface level uh, knowledge about, uh, like, his mom, but I, I just feel like it's it's just one of those things that most people know about. Uh, the fact that Reboot Gilliman is probably, like, the only... Um, like if, uh, the only Primarch to have had an actual mother figure in his life. Yeah. Uh, uh, which is maybe why he's so probably more well adjusted than all the other Primarchs. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, he's not a fucking like divulging man child. Exactly, exactly. He doesn't <laughs> have like any. He doesn't just have any psychotic dad yeah. as a uh, uh, as a parental figure. All in all, Rabute's entire like growing up was pretty stable. He had a good dad, a loving mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, and. I think uh, what, like, really adds to, like, the wholesomeness, in a sense, is just how badass his mom is. Uh, she she is a menace. She, at some point, uh, like, stood up to fucking Conrad Curse. <laughs> yeah. And told him to fuck off. <laughs> Basically, kind of, kind of, yeah. I mean, there was, the, in, the, in the aftermath of... I it was the the Night Lord invasion of McCrag, if I r- recall correctly. I feel like mm-hmm. my no, there was uh, no knowledge- Night Lord invasion of McCrag. The lion was a dick, uh, dumb shit, and he brought Conrad to McCrag, and then Conrad broke out. And oh, started you're fucking right, killing no, people you're right. in the capital fucking planet yeah. of Ultramar. <laughs> and Rabuti was like, "What the fuck did you do, lion?" <laughs> <laughs> but there was that thing where Gilliman saw his his mother somewhat somewhat I don't want to say traumatized but somewhat upset about the whole situation through this kind of like warp rift as it were I could be talking out my ass but I don't think I am um and he saw that and did did not think twice about walking through said warp rift just just to comfort her just to mm-hmm. just to get to her and say it's okay um and I, when you think about the kind of character of Bute Gilliman and how he is, and this, this, you know, the, the the relationship we had with his his adoptive mother and his adoptive father, and like you mentioned a moment ago about how none of the other Primarchs really had a proper female role model, it really does beg the question of how different would the setting have been if all of them got just that, you know, not necessarily better planets, not necessarily better, you know, yada yada yada, but just a proper singular female role model. I mean, didn't uh what's his face? Didn't didn't um Corvus kind of get that? I mean, he was raised by a whole plethora of people, wasn't he? In some fucking in a mine shaft essentially. Yeah, Cor- Corvus was a messiah complex. Yeah. But yeah I think w- a, f- a few of them had that I in think. in in the plague wars um after Rubute talks with the emperor he then makes like a statement to himself where his real parents were those that found him on uh, McCrag and the Emperor wasn't even a father to him. Yeah, I mean you could you can kind of understand that though I mean, when you think about it, you know in the real world how uh people who are, you know, given up at birth and adopted and through whatever means end up meeting their parents as adults. Their you know, their birth parents as adults, they still feel like those people are just strangers to them Mm. you know and that their true parentage you know lies within the people who actually put in the time and effort to make sure that they were mentally sound and that's what gilliman had you know and that is very 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 wholesome especially when you look at fucking angron and mortarian and the shit show those two idiots had to deal with hell i'm pretty sure for sure um what was the uh what was the um rebute's dad's name like cantor I think uh, it was Connor. That would be Connor. Connor. Con- yeah, yeah, Connor. Um, Connor Gilliman. Gil- 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 
Yep. He adopted mm-hmm. Rebute with no expectation that he was going to become a demigod. He, he literally <laughs> just adopted him to give to his like wife. And like, hey, I brought home a boy. <laughs> and then they were just so pleasantly surprised that he turned into a fucking ten foot tall god. Yeah. Hey, honey, look what I brought home. <laughs> it landed I, from low orbit. Oh. <laughs> honey, I have adopted Hercules himself. <laughs> so it's like Chris Griffith it came out of the womb the same size doesn't grow in much but it, it's really interesting to compare that to um, both the way uh, both in the ways that the lion was raised and the ways that Lehman was raised because they I mean less so Lehman but certainly more so the lion and Luther how Luther had put so much weight on the lion's shoulders right from birth and you know probably contributed into the lion being a a somewhat sketchy allegory for autism. Hmm. Um, and then, the, you know, a similar sort of situation with Lehman, how Lehman was, after the wolves, was adopted by a, what are ostensibly a group of space Vikings, you know, from a, a foreign world. And how they, as soon as they got him, they immediately put all this weight upon him. And Gilliman was just, and Gilliman's parents was like, yeah, no, just study. Just do well in school. Yeah. Stay balanced. You know, don't be a, don't be an asshat. Just you know, just take things seriously. Don't let it go to your head and do well. And most level-headed parents ever. Yeah, as your <laughs> child grows into a fucking massive person, who yeah. immediately just starts uh, outperforming every scholar ever. Yeah. But it, it's really funny though, because when you think about the um, the oh, what was the battle? Um, ah, oh, sod it. So, 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 so like, sorry, sorry for interrupting. But like, mother, father, I crave tact- tactical knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wish to be a general. <laughs> but if you think about the, um, I can't remember what the battle was, but it was a big one. It was the one where the word bearers Kalf. betrayed the ultramarines. The battle of Calf. Yeah, when the word oh. bearers betrayed the ultramarines, and for the first, and I think, I mean, don't Red might know. I'm not sure if I know, but I think for the first and maybe only time, that was the only time I can think of where Gilliman truly, like, 100 percent dropped the um, the charade of being a truly civilized man. When, yeah. when he completely lost his shit in space, yeah, <laughs> he, <laughs> he, <went super laughs> mode. he, yeah, he. He found, like, he was launched into the vacuum and found a full kilo of space coke, huffed it, <laughs> and then went on a real bender and bent some word bearers in the process. I guess you can say he really went berserk in ni- uh, 1997. <laughs> English dub. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, she's yeah, a that, 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 a hell of a drug man. God damn it. <laughs> exactly. I wonder what oh, I would that, do. That, that is a beautiful scene. Yeah, like <laughs> fucking away from the wholesomeness for a second. Imagine being that word bearer outside the ship, like, haha, we <laughs> killed the Primarch of the Ultramarines. And then you see him fucking like, sw- like fucking swimming towards you in space. And you're just like, wait. <laughs> wait. <laughs> just aggressively <laughs> <crushed> <laughs> not <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> just doing the fucking strokes towards you, like, yeah, no noise because the vacuum is space, <laughs> but you, you just see him, like, yeah. fucking do- <laughs> do- doggy paddling towards you, like, I'll fucking hit you. Like, <laughs> oh, just just, from, the, just from that word bearer's perspective, just wait a minute. No, that's that's not fair. <laughs> you just, you can just oh, imagine man. being another word bearer, like, facing the opposite direction. It's like, why can I hear a really deep scream? I'm in space. You just turn around and Gilliman is like bending reality so he's screaming in space with rage. <laughs> but you know in that squad there was one where Bear that went, right, they're Primarchs. Like, yeah. like, ah, yes, that's not before, that easy. Shit. Before he got punched through his chest, like JoJo style. Yeah, just, yeah they, a Gilliman oh. fist-shaped hole in his abdomen. Mm. Mm. But we really should have fought this one through. Snaps his fingers like ah oh, should have guessed. Oh, dead. <laughs> <laughs> like not even mad about it, just like oh fuck, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know what? That's on me, G Man. That's on me. <laughs> We have a really, uh, we have a really fun one next. Actually, that uh, another one, another one of Moots that I really, really liked. 
Um, and I should have thought of it, but I didn't. But that's the relationship between Barabbas Dantioch of the Iron Warriors and Alexis Pollux of Wait, the Imperial the Iron Fists. Warriors? Warriors. <laughs> the fu- fucking the Warrior Warriors? The, the fuck? Warriors. Uh, and fucking, excuse me, his uh, full title is Barabbas Titanium Balls Barabbas Dantioch. Barabbas Titanium <laughs> Balls Dantioch. <laughs> he is the fucking straightest gay man in 40k, all right? You, <laughs> you, you've heard of Hercules, but have you heard of Testicules? <laughs> <laughs> Look, no other, no one else had the balls to flashbang curves like he did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, no, I mean it's uh, it's like we have many examples of this in the heresy and like through forty k as well. But just when you have these like real genuine friendships between these characters yeah. and Barabbas and Alexis, just perfectly encapsulated that since you know it's 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 the right it's it's the bitter rivalry between the iron warriors and the imperial fists and these guys still through it all they're like fuck yeah buddies let's fucking get this fuck conrad curse fuck the traitors and fucking blows up the fucking ferris beacon fucking r.i.p my boy barabbas but it's uh, (laughs) like honestly their whole entire dynamic it really shows like how good Iron Warriors and Imperial Fists yeah, the would what be could have if been. they actually work together because they yeah. those two together are were actually put in charge of defending Ultramar by Rebute Gilliman. In fact, yeah. Yeah. Barbus did such a good job. Gilliman straight up says, I'm adopting all of your Iron Warriors. Yeah. He yeah. says they're not yeah. sons of Perturabo anymore. They're my sons, and which is where we get mm-hmm. the fucking Slice of the Emperor and Iron Skull and Silver Skulls chapters we didn't know. It's beautiful. Actually, sorry, I want to I want to interrupt there a little quick, a little bit. Red, do you want to elaborate on the silver skulls a little bit? Because I don't think I don't think actually many people actually know that the connection between the the sort of spiritual connection between the silver skulls and Barabbas Dantioch. Okay, so there's two chapters actually that are ultramarine successors, right? In quotation so, marks. In quotation marks, and they're ultramarine successors <laughs> truly because like. They were like in the heresy, Barbus's Iron Warriors, who were called Sons of Dantioch, were adopted by uh, Gilliman. He wiped away their slate, their history, and said, All right, you're sons of fucking Ultramar now. You're my sons, so you'll be carrying the Ultramarine banner now. And they were more than happy because they were pissed off the Perturabo, right? Anyway, so <clears throat> fucking Shadaddle, uh, Skedaddle, uh, 10, uh, 10k <laughs> years later, you have two chapters. One is the size of the Emperor that actually have the home planet on the planet where Dantioch was given by Gilliman, and they keep his helmet as a relic. In fact, it's a helmet <clears> that the chapter master wears. If you didn't know, Barbus had yeah. like this helmet that he welded to his face. I, I know I asked you to go off on this spiel, but I didn't actually know that. I was going to mention that as well, which in of itself is kind of a wholesome thing, considering that they, yeah. like, e- e- even though they don't remember... Dantioch himself anymore. They just know that this is a very important relic, and the fact that his legacy and uh, uh, just lives on in this way. Yeah. So, Slice of the Emperor. It's not really known if they are the sons of Dantioch that long ago, but they're on the same planet. They honor his helmet. It makes sense that they are just the same guys, you know, who yeah. like just evolved over time. And then you have the Silver Skulls, which is just blatantly, obviously, fucking Iron Warriors. But they're again, they're ultramarine successors, quote unquote. Yeah. But they're not stated at to be iron warriors in the lore fucking anywhere. So those people trying to use them as an excuse to have traitor gene seed loyalist chapters don't. So that's a, that's a homebrew <laughs> thing, everybody. That's a homebrew thing. Trying to anyway. Uh, that, yeah. That was, yeah that, that's just a side note. But yeah, um, yeah. There, there's those two chapters. They're perceived to be the the descendants from the iron warriors that Gilman adopted. Anyway, back back to Barbus and Alexis Pollux. Um, <laughs> one, one of the things uh, that a lot of people is that Alexis was actually very suspicious of da- uh, of Dantioch when yeah. they first met because he's like, "What the fuck's an Iron Warrior doing here?" Yeah, and Gilman explains, "No, he's on our side. He's helping me." And Alexis is like, "I don't fucking trust him." And then Barbus, quote, like figuratively and maybe literally, bent over backwards for Alexis <laughs> to yep. like accept him as like he just wants to help. And eventually, it cascaded into like they're being really good friends. They like worked very well together. They locked down Ultramar against like the word bearers, the world eaters. They were badass together. And eventually, um, uh, 
uh, Barbus detonated the Ferris device to uh, take it away from traitor hands. It ended up killing him. It wounded him. He, he, died, he died later of his wounds. And as he lay dying, Alexis found him. And uh, uh, they were like, uh, shared their last few moments together. And uh, it's said that Alexis stayed there for hours because no one could D move days. him away. It was, it was, t it was two days that he was, um, that Alexis Pollux was essentially immobilized and he actually got only pulled out of it. Um, in fact, I've got, the, I've actually got the, uh, the transcript right here. <clears throat> I'll just go over quickly. Um, and this, so this was after, this was, this was after, um, Dantioch had died. Uh, they looked over at the Imperial Fist, sitting immobile by his friend in the center of the chamber. Someone had draped a blanket around his shoulders, but otherwise he remained as he had been found, motionless with grief, refusing food, water, or help. He has not moved since we came here, but sits in vigil. Well, that will not do, Pollux, Gilliman called, raising his voice. Pollux looked up. I command you to rise, Captain Alexis Pollux of the Imperial Fists, ordered Gilliman. He stood, the blanket slipping from his shoulders. My Lord Gilliman, it is time you let us take care of the warsmith. And so this, is, this sort of here shows, you know, Gilliman caring about Dantioch and Dantioch dying as well. And he says, <clears throat> we shall commemorate his deeds this evening as the night falls in a manner befitting a true hero of the Imperium. <clears throat> uh, and then, you know, so someone made a move to shift him and, um, uh, and Pollock's basically said, no. Uh, none shall touch him. I will carry him, for he was my brother. Mm. You know, and mm. it's just ah, oh, god damn. You know, it, it's beautiful. Th that's that's love. That's actual. <laughs> that's actual love. And in a setting where yes. you know you've got big burly men with guns clad in fucking tank armor and all this other bullshit, to have true uh, platonic love shared between you know brothers like quote that is, unquote. <laughs> well, what, the platonic bit. <laughs> well, it was some kind of love. We can agree on that. But I just, ah, uh, but even, I mean, I, I never took into account just now Gilliman's reverence of of Dantioch, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, Dantioch really, really showed himself capable and uh, really just showed what it's like to be like like a true loyalist he was loyal to the core and uh, to the point where he would fucking uh, disobey and betray quote unquote betray his father yeah um, and which led to this you know just super sweet and wholesome deep friendship deep loving friendship yeah well it draws i mean i know it's a bit obvious because obviously traitors remaining loyalists but it, it, there's so many parallels you can draw between barabas dantioch and that of garviel loken mm. you know mm. and for anyone who yes. doesn't know garviel loken the protagonist for much of horus rising and much of the Hor much of many books in the horus heresy the uh, the first character you really get to see through the eyes of when you start reading the horus heresy books he's a son of Horus, or more accurately, a lunar wolf, who told Horus to his face that, you know, and I, I, I think I'm quoting here, I reject you now and always, you know, and the, <clears throat> the, 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 the parallels between Loken and Dantioch in going, now, fuck you, dad, you know, fuck you guys, yeah. fuck what you stand for. What I stand for is doing the right thing, and doing the right thing is standing behind these people who, uh, who, who are capable of supporting the Emperor, supporting the Imperium, and inadvertently, you know, showing love. I mean, shit, think about Loken and uh, Torgaden, you know? Yeah. Those two fucking loved each other, man. I mean, Loken was fucking traumatized with what happened to Torgaden. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Shit. Well, it, the, that's one of the beautiful things about these characters when you have, as you said, the big this be these big burly men and we, for so long, we've associated them with the cold calculating weapons but yeah uh, as we've discussed many times over the deep inside they are humans they are still very broken humans yeah. but still humans the best description of a, a space marine is a fucking biologically enhanced child soldier yeah that's yep. emotionally stunted mm. to the core but the emotions are still there 
Yeah. So, like, with enough, like, wisdom and temperaments, they can process, you know, human emotions. I mean, it's like what you, what you told me, Red, about Hell's Reach. The, is it Hell's Reach? The Black Templars. Mm -hmm. We all, as a community, look at the Black Templars as these pillars of religious zeal. But the care they have for their fellow man, and it's show, you know, shown off in Hell's Reach, is uh, profound, you know. But there's a really funny excerpt that I think is from one of the Plague Wars books. Um, that really shows off the difference between 30k marines and 40k marines where Gilliman has his ultramarines, a group of his ultramarines stood around him and he's doing some bloody bureaucratic shite and he realizes the mood is somber and he tries to crack a joke and he thinks to himself <laughs> that that joke would have killed, you know, 10,000 years ago and all of his ultramarines <laughs> in 40k just look at him like he just shat his pants or something because they don't understand <laughs> their father's humor like his, like his sons of old did. That's yeah. That's another big thing is that psycho indoctrination is only a thing after the heresy because they didn't yeah. want Marines going renegade. It didn't fucking work. Congratulations. No. Nope. Um, but <laughs> definitely, Marines were very much more human in 30k than they were in 40k, which is probably what yeah. led to part of the heresy. Definitely. Because like, if you read, um, like we'll we'll get on to the some other things, but like the, again, <laughs> I referenced the omnibus. Yep. <laughs> like the night lords, the old, the old that, night lords omnibus. The night lords in that are very, very human um, compared to what most people would think. They're night lords still, but like they're of they're course. capable of jokes. They're capable of somber moods, and you know when one of their brothers dies, it affects them deeply because it's like that was their brother. It's, yeah. It's a whole. It's a whole spiel. <clears throat> Anyways, shall we move on to our next entry? I think. I think. I think you. You both suggested this one. This one's actually quite funny. Uh, and and <laughs> Ligia, I've just written down the words "grandfather Nurgle." Yes. <laughs> what is more wholesome than the grandfather himself? He who gives his gifts freely to all those in need. Damn straight. Damn straight. Damn straight. I, I think he's actually in, on, on the on the. I mean, I'm, I might be jumping a few steps here, but I think on the topic of love, I think he's the only chaos god that we've got reason to believe actually genuinely loves the people who who follow and worship him. Actually, has a genuine degree of love for those who are willing to go. Yeah, man, I'm down with a sickness. You know, <laughs> I mean, just, just look at this model in particular. Look how, look how jolly this man is. He is a man wanting to bring you nothing but good mm. vibes. Look at that smile. Mm. Look at that man's smile. Like, yeah. a really, like a really good example of Nogle being an all an all around nice fella, smart fella, smart fella, smart smeller, smart fella. Um, yep. <laughs> is is um, the Kukaf story. Where yeah. he falls into the pot, gets lost in the sauce a little bit, and then he the comes sauce. out as a great unclean one, thinking Nogel would be absolutely wrathful and spiteful towards him. Because he drank his like his best like disease that he just brewed. Yeah. He felt like he ruined <laughs> Nurgle's fucking uh, project, and he grew to the size of a great unclean one. And he thought he was about to get absolutely back backhanded, and <laughs> Nurgle's there like, oh no. I've got a brand new son who incorporates the best disease I've ever made. Hmm. Yeah, and he's just so he's, happy with him. Just so happy yeah, with him. He was super chuffed. He was like, um, like a British dad. It's a, a, a wonderful short Aaron did a few months ago on Kugath. And if anyone who doesn't know, you know, I'll just say that Kugath was a nurgling who fell into this cauldron that, that Nurgle was brewing the greatest ever disease in. And he fell into it and he got a taste of it and he just loved how it tasted. So he slurped the whole fucking thing up came out as a great unclean one because he just swelled in size and he was so worried that <laughs> dear old granddad was going to be pissed and granddad was like no 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 I'm not pissed not only do I still have my disease but I have a new son who is that disease oh my god I love you and it's like oh <laughs> the, grandpa my man <laughs> my you know? he might make people's skin and balls melt off but my god does he love his boys <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's another really good bit sorry with um, some of the other demons like uh, Beasts of Nurgle, they might be a little bit low on the IQ points, but they are just big, like puppy dogs <laughs> they in a are. giant, disgusting body. They are so happy. They, they just, just want, want snuggles. To play. They just want. They just want like, snuggles, man. Like in Dark Tide, if they're hunting you down, thinking they want to eat your booty, 
No, they just want to play and hug you. Yeah, they, they, and they just want to. They just want to play around. They mean nothing bad. They just want to. They just want to cuddle yeah. and maybe a little bit of vor. But you know, it, no. it is what and it is. No. It's really tragic for those things, actually, because if you obviously hate them, run away from them, or they just kill all of their accidental play buddies because they're acidic as shit. Um, they end up cocooning and turning into the the fly, the drones of Nurgle, that like the big hateful raffle flies, the plague bearers ride, and those things just want to kill you because they're just all the negative emotions that uh, have caused the beasts of Nurgle to transform into those things. Well, that's it. I think. I think also another thing as well, with, with, where the um, the plague drones or plague flies, whatever the fuck they're called, where, where that mm. happens is if a um, if a beast of Nurgle, these jolly big fuckers, don't get. To re- don't get to share their love enough, they feel rejected, and then they undergo the metamorphosis because yeah, you know, yeah, and then yeah. they come out fully embracing that sort of rejected side of it all. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's 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 like it's like the, it's not a phase, mum, but it's it is a it's unfortunately a permanent change. Um, <laughs> so so it isn't the phase. <laughs> yeah, but it's there's. Permanent. There's some great fucking examples of Nurgle being a good guy. Look at Nurglings; they're just always so happy. Oh, they're, yeah, they're, they're just look, look yeah, at they're fucking chill, particular man. Slimux, the the snail man gardener of Nurgle. Yeah, <laughs> he's just having a good time tending to his garden, bro. He's a gardener. He's a gardener, is what he is. You know, <laughs> and like literally every single decent follower of Nurgle gets all their pain, pain and shit taken away. Yeah, and they're just constantly happy about it. They're just lovely guys. Lovely fellas, give them a hug. When you think about, you know, space marines or people, cultists, what have you, turning to the chaos gods, you know, when you th- you think about Slanesh, it's like, oh, you're going to feel so much pleasure. You think about Corn, it's like, oh, you'll know battle. You think about Zinch, oh, fuck you. Um, but when you think <laughs> when you think about Nurgle, it all they say to you is you're going to you get to experience the grandfather's love now. You get to feel his embrace and it, that's what it's all about it's all about coming together as a pile of mush and shit but still and then they generously <laughs> fold your clothes 14 times with you still inside of them <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's what's, just a good guy. what's more generous no, than someone player. doing your laundry for you exactly <laughs> man <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm talking about and also God and Nurgle Super chill place. No, <laughs> I'd smoke with him. He's a cool guy. <laughs> yeah, you visit him in, uh, during the Halloween episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never mind you shaking in fear. That was just shock from being in such a a good place. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> there's terror that I was back here. Actually, I wanted to stay there. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, man. We'll send you back at some point. We'll, we'll try and send you back. Soon. Please, please. My, whole, my, my annual leave is booked, man. You've got to let me out of here. I'll, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Who the fuck gave you vacation days? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, our next one is one by Red. And Red, you're going to have to lead the way on this one because I have not read Twice Dead King. Uh, yes. Red simply suggested the ending of Twice Dead King. Of course. Of course. The ending of Twice Dead King. What is... What is more wholesome than coming to terms with your people's affliction and understanding their plight and leading them to a glorious revolution? <laughs> hmm? The ending, of the, like you may, you may think that Twice Dead King is a somber, depressing novel, but no, it is a call to action for their king to finally claim his throne. Yeah, of his <clears throat> flayer subjects. God, that's fucking what? flayers, man. Sorry, please continue. <laughs> <laughs> Flashbacks to uh, yeah. being, what's it called? Um, that was Dawn of War. Dawn yeah, of War, that's the one, yeah. <laughs> 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 just, just minding my own business in VC, and Tom just goes, would you stop doing that? <laughs> <laughs> no, Tom, from- I'm leading the flayers in a new revolution. You don't understand. <laughs> they need your skin. I'm you sorry, have I'm more than enough to give. I feel anyway. you, you are literally the twice dead king and a night lord. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, going off of that, at the end of Twice Dead King, Ultix, the protagonist in the second book, uh, finally understands what the flare virus is. It isn't a mutation and it doesn't destroy the minds of his people. It just changes them. He accepts yeah. them as they are. What's more wholesome than just acceptance, mm-hmm. right? 
Yeah, and mm-hmm. he then heroically crashes his ship into an imperial, uh, like an, a giant imperial ship called the Polyphemus, in an attempt to uh, distract them while his people get away. And in the bowels of the ship, he re- resurrects and understands a new view on things. And in the ship, he meets his flare uh, subjects. And he understands after communicating with his best friend, who is uh, unfortunately turned into a flare. And finally, he understands where they're at. They're still in there, that they are still his people. So in, one, in a final hurrah, he leads his new people throughout the ship, killing the vile humans that have been attacking them and pursuing them <laughs> in glorious retribution. <laughs> and finally, reunites with his other people and brings them to a new planet where they can start a new life as the fucking twice dead king. Wow. Flaying people alive all along the way. <laughs> listen, it was fucking. Ho, ho, ho. It, listen, listen, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't um, make fun of a schizophrenic. <laughs> <laughs> no, not if he was fucking seven and a half feet tall, had claws for hands, and was wearing my neighbor's skin. You're right, I fucking wouldn't. <laughs> not for a minute. We, we all have our vices. Some people like <laughs> cigarettes. Some people like uh, junk food. Some want to skin you, all right? Someone will skin you, yeah, <laughs> They're absolutely. all people still. We shouldn't judge them. No, you're right. <laughs> we, we have to move forwards as a society <clears throat> and accept that it is okay to wear another human being's skin. Yes, exactly. exactly. Uh, you know, it, this is progress, gentlemen. This is how we move Th- forward as a species. This is, this is beautiful. Yeah. We're progressives, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, I, I just thought when, when you said that you you wouldn't download a skin. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, they acquire the skins through legal means. All right. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know. Actually, technically, I'll throw this out there because I'm, I'm a fucking <laughs> asshole. Based upon the Based. the laws of 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 claiming set down by the leagues of Votan. Oh yeah, the mm. flayers taking people's skin is perfectly legal because if you liked, if you needed your skin more than the flayers did, you would have fought harder to keep it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So that's a very good uh, one we didn't talk about. Yeah. Is, uh, I'll reference the greatest quote of mankind: "That property is theft." <laughs> and- <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> So, technically, I'm not doing anything. I'm just stealing what you already stole. Oh, Jesus Christ. What a grand and intoxicating ideal, don't you agree? Your skin? You mean our Ma- skin? Ma- our skin. Ma- There's room in there for two. Sayor. <laughs> uh, on, on Tom's note of Votar, that's something we should have uh, put in the list. Well, so the whole kin as kin, they respect everyone as, as oh, family, yeah. regardless of the, the mm. like, iron kin or normal Votan. Yeah, as long as you're under five foot one, the Votan are the most accepting um, <laughs> people, and, and not a squat. You know, the, 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 the Votan are the most accepting people around, you know? My, they also don't my, fight each other, people. ever. No, they don't. Finally. They're great. Representation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'll fight you. Vindication. <laughs> <laughs> I have to punch down a little bit. Let's That's fine. talk about Vulcan and slash or slash the salamanders. Mm. So this one was obvious, I guess. Good fellows. I, I, yeah, I'm, it was. Absolutely, yeah. I, I'm yeah, pretty 100%. sure all the salamander fans are going, yeah, they included Vulcan right now. Shut up, all of you. Shut up. He burned a child alive <laughs> just to start off. All right? We didn't do this for you. Yeah, this isn't for you. <laughs> This is oh my this God. is just filler for the list, all right? Oh my God! <laughs> Don't listen to him, old sweet audience. We do this all for you. <laughs> uh, but but nah, yeah, like Vulcan is probably uh, up there, probably nicer than Gilliman, actually. Oh yeah, because um, he his entire shtick is uh, protecting civilians and burning people alive. <laughs> a very careful tightrope that they walk. <laughs> you know when uh, Vin Diesel, aka Dom Toretto, says "family." That's just Vulcan. Mm. That's just Vulcan. Mm. You know? Yeah. I yeah. mean, I'd I'd love to. I'm going to read another extract that I I, I found earlier <laughs> for this that I really like, and it was it, after um, 
Vulcan had managed to make his way back to Terra during the heresy. Mm. Uh, and I'll, I'll just read it as it is. It's a very short one, but I really, really like it because obviously uh, Rogel Dawn is kind of a uh, kind of a, a, uh, a fridge freezer of a man. You yeah. know, I, I, I love this scene as well. Yeah. Oh, you know, you know. So he says. So upon re- yeah. uh, so upon reaching Dawn, he smiled warmly. It is good to see you, Rogel. Dawn nodded, ever reserved. He sheathed his sword, and at the signal from the Primarch, Vulcan heard the sound of twenty Imperial fists disengaging and powering down their weapons. You look older, brother, said Vulcan. And you were no different from the day we met, Dawn answered coolly. I heard you had died. His annoyance at being called away from his numerous duties and responsibilities faded, though Vulcan could see the burden still weighed heavily. I have long waited to see my brothers again. The ones not trying to kill me, at least. Dawn's jaw (laughs) stiffened at the remark. Suggesting some unspoken pain or regret, Vulcan did not press him. Some truths were best left unsaid. I would embrace you, Vulcan confessed. But that was never your way, was it, Rogel? Dawn laughed gruffly. Abstention is a wise decision. Vulcan embraced him firmly anyway, and felt his affection for his brother returned, albeit awkwardly. And as they parted, the smile did not quite reach Dawn's eyes, though his expression was not unkind. I am glad you live. Of late, I have found precious little to celebrate. And so this, this, this notion that even though the Primarch said Rogel Dawn exemplifying this more than any of them, by far, as being pillars of duty, pillars of purpose, in the presence of Vulcan, he can't help but be glad someone came to give him a hug. You know, <laughs> yeah. this, this, Super wholesome. This beyond human, not even human. Um, being of, you know, warp energies and whatever the fuck Primarchs are made out of, was able to, for the first and probably the last time in his life, smile because of Vulcan. Mm. Uh, And that's just, oh, god damn. I know we all make the TTS jokes about, you know, about, come here, brother, let me give you a hug. And (laughs) they're goofy as shit, you know, whatever. But Vulcan is a wholesome bastard. There's no two ways about it, you know? This shortly being before Vulcan kills an Eldar child going insane and uh, Dawn gets ripped apart by berserkers. Hey man, I like I like my Eldar children crispy, all right? He did nothing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you had a fucking Harlequin in, I bet you do. Um what else? Yeah. I meant to burn, okay? It's in the name. I would like to talk about when he met the Salamanders. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh great idea. Mm-hmm. Go so ahead. um during uh the time when the Primarchs were being found, the Salamanders were basically thrown into um rear rear guard duty as they always do, and there was a section of his sons that was pinned down and fighting in a world where they were actually kind of losing. Uh and they were trying their damnedest to fight back and save these people. I'm not too sh- sure what it, they were fighting against. I don't remember. But I remember as soon as Vulcan heard, he took the sons that he met and fucking beelined it over there to his sons. And when they found, he found them and he uh, helped them fight. And when they saw him, they were like enraptured by him. And then he kneeled before them saying that he was, un- because they said we're unworthy to meet you. But then he kneeled down before them and saying, no, I'm the one that's unworthy. He's such a good guy. I mean, like, honestly, what was there, more is there to say about this guy? <laughs> not, not that I don't like talking about him. I love talking about this guy. He's just, he's just he's just a big ball of good energy, and I I just I, I just love the man. I, I don't quote me on this, but I remember reading somewhere, and this might have been an opinion piece, so you know, whatever. Hmm. But I remember hmm. I remember reading somewhere that Vulcan was the Emperor's favorite. And I know we, we also have reason to believe that Gilliman was the Emperor's favorite when you know in, in Gilliman's return. However, we'll just we'll just bench that for a second and assume that the first premise is correct. I mean, clearly and, I think it was Magnus, but and the, uh, yeah. <laughs> and the reason being is that Vulcan, unlike all of the other Primarchs, was by far the most human. He truly yeah. embodied mm. something that oh that all no, his whole being was centered around a concept that the other Primarchs could only ever grasp temporarily. You know, uh, Ferris and Fulgrim had, you know, that temporarily, and it fucked up because someone got a very uh, permanent haircut. 
you know, <laughs> you, 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 and it, uh, you think about how you know Horace's relationship Ferris relationship said a little with, off the top, Fulgrim, but unbeknownst to him, Fulgrim <laughs> did a whole lot of meth that day. I've yeah. never been to barber school, and uh, <laughs> the the relationship with Horace and Sanguinius, and how even as Horace had completely lost his bananas, still wished he never had to face Sanguinius, not because he couldn't defeat him. But because he knew he could, and didn't want mm. to, you know. Yeah. And these are these are just fractions of things that Vulcan embodied in his entirety throughout his entire existence, and it's reflected in the salamanders as well to an extent. People like to talk about how the salamanders get to go back and see their families after they've you know completed their training, and I think that is true. I don't think it's I don't think it's a case of oh yeah we're on leave so we're going to go see our families again. I think it's literally just. It is if and when they return to Nocturne. Yeah. And you've got to think as well the life of a space marine. It's like one tour of duty is like two whole lifetimes. Yeah. So by the time they get back, their families are in the bin. But they always get to see them after they've completed their augmentations and their training, and they get to see what they've become. On top of them going back to their families, if that marine dies, whether they're an aspirant or a full-fledged marine, but... If they die and their family is still there, or even their descendants of their family are still there, the chapter will give them a medallion to honor that Marine. And so, like, mm. if the family ever needs something, they can use that medallion f to get the Marine's help. Oh, oh, that's so fucking good. And you think about it as well. Wow. I mean, let's, I wanna, I'm going to take you to a dark place, but let's contrast this <laughs> to, was it Sevatar? The, uh, the Night Lord who mm. saw his mother at a parade or something. That's Talos. That's Talos. Uh, didn't she, didn't she, what happened to her? Didn't she just get bolted in the mouth or something? Okay, so, um, I think, uh, 10th Company went back to Nostromo because Malkarian, the War Sage, was a sentimental bastard and he wanted to have his Marines on parade to show, like, Nostromo, hey, look at us, we're re doing really good, we're heroes. Anyway, during this parade, Nostromo was kind of a fucked place, so all these people are shot because they, they, they haven't seen their kids since they left to become Marines. So there's a bunch of these people in the crowd shouting out names and hoping, and finally they break through the line through the guards. These are just normal human guards because the Marines are in, like, parade formation. Anyway, so they're all yelling, screaming names, and finally um, Talos hears a woman call out his name. And he looks over for a second, and she notices that he looked over, so she walked up to, um, or ran up to try and, like, talk to him and, like, get his attention. And meanwhile, yeah. the guards are, like, trying to aim down the lines, but they don't want to hit the Marines. So anyway, he continues forward, and she's left behind, and then she just gets blasted. <sighs> dead in the street. <sighs> and when... No. And when, talk <laughs> and when talking to Zarl, his brother, later on, Zarl's like, didn't you recognize who that was? And Talos is like, no, I didn't. He's like, that was your mom, Talos. And and Talos is like, oh, fuck, I, I didn't, I, I, I literally do not know. I do not remember. <laughs> so, as it turns out, there is a pretty big difference between Night Lords and Salamanders. But it's, yeah, yeah. Isn't that <laughs> just the start? <laughs> Never would have just, guessed. But isn't that, how, isn't that curious as well when you, you, you look at these two and think, these two are polar motherfucking opposites. And it was the Night Lord who tortured the Salamander for however many weeks, months, or years it was, you know. And you gotta think there must have been some part of I mean, I know one of the one of the best character traits that uh Kurz had was his acceptance of what is of what of what he was. He always he always <laughs> knew what he was. Yeah. But there must have been some massive part of him torturing Vulcan that was jealous. No, you know. yeah, like he, a lot of the, it was he hated Vulcan for like how compassionate he was. He thought it was sick. He didn't understand it. He yeah. told Vulcan, you kill people. You murdered like thousands in like glorious wars. My sons, they go murder, like you more, like he said, you murder millions and burn them alive. My sons go kill a couple of thousand yet we're the bad guys. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because the Night Lords got his uh, Kurs didn't understand that it was the compassion of Vulcan that was what kept what is his real strength. It wasn't the fact that he killed people in open combat. It was that he was compassionate. The worlds that he conquered were rebuilt, and they understood like what the enlightenment of the Imperium was. Right. This next one was actually a suggestion from Red, and I'm going to need you to give me some context on this, Red, because this reads as more of a tragedy to me. You've actually just written the Lamenters. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find the wholesomeness here and I ain't seeing it bro I'm not seeing it 
The wholesome is, is that the Lamenters are good guys. They just get fucked over by GW at every single uh, uh, turn that they take. <laughs> All right, so dive into the wholesome for me, because I, I want to learn. I want to know what you mean, because plenty of chapters are just good guys, you know. Why are the Lamenters so, on here, man? So one of the reasons about the Lamenters is that a lot of chapters don't like them because of how humble they are. A lot of chapters think that they're blowing smoke up the other's ass, that they think they're better. Because everyone has this... Um, the other chapters have this assumption that the Lamenters think they're better than them. But no, the Lamenters actually <clears> think that they're very, like, um, very... Uh, what is, what's the word I'm looking for? That they're basically, like, really terrible at their job. During a campaign, oh, during a campaign at the, with the Ultramarines, the Lamenters performed very well, and so Marnius Calgar himself walked up and offered them like a seal of a McCrag, a really high honor to be given for their duty. And the Lamenters rejected it because they said we didn't perform, um, we didn't perform as well as we wanted to. We felt like we failed during that. And Marnius Calgar was like, "Oh, you think you're too much, so much better than us? Well, fuck you then." <laughs> yes, <laughs> and it, it kind of it, it kind of is like yeah that that's a, the tragic part that they're basically in the short end of the stick all the fucking time, but it's more about that in a in a universe where literally everyone hates them and everyone wants to kill them and every bad thing has ever happened to a chapter has happened to them, the lamenters stay resolute and maintain their beliefs of uh, prioritizing civilians and you know being angels yeah. even though that. The universe wants them fucking dead. <laughs> and it yeah. fucking does. You cue slow fade out to Gutsu playing in the background. <laughs> well, they're such a wonderful... Now you said all that. They are, I think back to my own knowledge on the Lamenters, they're such a wonderful embodiment of self-sacrifice. I mean, yeah, sure, they made a few fucky wuckies during Badab, but... <laughs> I mean, even I'm pretty sure even during Badab, there's some extracts about how they, you know, uh, put themselves in in firing lines to help civilians. Um, no, yeah, and then when obviously they're fighting the Car I think it was when they're fighting the Minotaurs or the Carcharodons. The Lamenters were trying to stop them from destroying everything, <laughs> so they're basically yeah. throwing themselves <laughs> on the shark shaped pyre. <laughs> yeah, and it's mental. It's absolutely mental. And then you fast forward a few hundred years, and their penitence crusades. Barely surviving the Tyranids, barely surviving the Tyranids the second time, <laughs> and, you know, and, all, and all this other shit. And it's it is really really interesting. And they they actually have a I can't remember what it's called. I don't have my notes to hand, but they have a name, a special name for their apothecarian, because the healers you do they, it over time. They consider the healers of the, the chapter to be so overwhelmingly important although i'm sure it has something to do with collecting more gene seed for reuse than any other chapter in history but still you know um i, I do think that's very special i mean we, everyone forgets that the lamenters came from the 21st cursed founding like they mm -hmm. were fucked from the word go they were completely <laughs> fucked definitely Yes, yeah, someone fucking hates them, and we don't know who. <laughs> <laughs> well, I cannot wait to see them being used again in you know current narratives because it will happen, and we're going to see more mm. of their tragedy and more of their resilience. Um, and I think you're right. Actually, they do belong in the wholesome list. They they do have so much right. going for them that makes them so exemplary mm. in the face of the worst bullshit that the universe can muster. Mm. Um, just as no one's mentioned it yet in that list is them warp jumping their flagship into a sun um, <laughs> and losing their chapter master <coughs> why did they do that? they didn't do it on purpose um, <laughs> accident <laughs> tactical <coughs> error bad luck like, that happened uh, like, canonically that did happen they did just lose their chapter master and their flagship by just jumping into a sun by accident it, it, let, let, let's put it this way there's this um fan game called Chapter Master, if anyone knows about it. It's a super fun, like, RTS uh, uh, type game. You can build your own chapter. And uh, one of the things you can choose, is, like, among, like, different traits you can pick for your custom chapter is incredibly bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> I think I see where this is going. Yep. And uh, <clears throat> whatever happened to the uh, Lamenters, I'm pretty sure wh whoever picked their fucking traits put uh, sh shows that one. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Anyways, let's move on to the next one. Now, this one was actually Moots' suggestion. A wonderful suggestion it is. Hell yeah, Tusker. 
So the orc war boss Tusker and his boys fighting for all eternity in the realm of corn. Oh yes. <laughs> like just imagine you are just you're bored out of your mind. You're so bored of all the humans. You're bored of all the uh, Eldars or all the knife ears, whatever. And uh, you, you just go, you know what? Fucking uh, the warp. That's where the shit's at. <laughs> and you just <clears throat> jump on in. You start wrecking shit on all kinds of different planets. You mess with Slanesh, you mess with Zinch, you mess with Nurgle, and finally you land on a planet where some champion of corn is. You fucking die, but you're kicking the nads of the fucking demon. So what happened was they went through, uh, they, they warp jump, and their gala field failed, and so a bunch of demons got in, and they fucking had such a great time fighting them, they're just like, oh, lads, how do we find more of these guys? And Tuska <laughs> goes, oh, no way, that big shawny thing next to the Yumi's. <laughs> and then Tuska brings his fucking demon wall over Cadia, <laughs> and the Cadians are just watching as this massive orc fleet touches down on one of their moons, <laughs> fucking decimates everything because they want like some practice right before they go in. Then they pick everything up. <laughs> they don't do anything on that planet but fuck up a lot of Imperial Guardsmen. And then they fly directly into the fucking Eye of Terror, and all the humans are going... What the fuck just happened? <laughs> and then Tuska is, is, fuck, is flying around, like cruising to fucking what I can only assume is Dragula, but orc cover. And he touches down on the corn planet and awakens a bunch of corn demons. He's like, oh, lights, we found the promised land. <laughs> the fun thing is, when he's on this planet, he meets, he and his boys end up, well, but before they get to that planet, they actually go and fuck up a demon world of all three of the other gods before they get to that planet. Yeah, yeah, as I mentioned, yeah. And when they get to that planet, like like Moose also mentioned, they do meet a champion of corn, a demon prince just called the Blood Prince. And they're losing this fight fucking hard. Uh, even Tusker is getting fucked. But before Tusker dies, he takes his power claw, and I shit you not, he stabs the Blood Prince in the gonads with it. He stabs him in the Johnson. He fucking <laughs> opens his sack. You know, he, he gives him his fucking yogurt can. He always yeah. flows forth. He, uh... Have you ever seen a hydraulic press? Yeah, he did that to <laughs> yes. his fucking gonads. Yeah, he gave him uh, an unwanted operation. Anyways, uh, long story short, after he did that, Corn was like, Shit, these guys are a lot of fucking fun. Yo, what the <laughs> fuck? Yeah. Where did these he guys like, come from? <laughs> he, he Holy just like, shit. Guys, <laughs> I vibe with these guys. <laughs> now so good again. <laughs> and so, so what happens is he he revived them, but he didn't revive them to that demon world. When they when when Tusker and his boys awoke, they were at the brass citadel of corn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Korn, at the feet of his goddamn throne. Literally there, like front row seats to see Corn's toes, like all up in that bitch. <laughs> and, oh, good no. <laughs> like, oh there, there's so many bad implications of them having front, front light seats to Korn's toes. <laughs> they, they, they literally, they were so, Corn liked them so much, he said, you don't even need to go to the Corn gym. You don't need to see the alligator. You just, you can have, you can have it. <laughs> And when they when they awoke, they, they literally—I don't know if you know this—but the general assumption is in front of the brass citadel is just this perpetual battlefield, yeah. you know, this perpetual, everlasting battlefield of corn and things that have worshipped corn. And then there's just these there's you got all these red bastards, and then there's just this small group, a small you know comparatively group of green <laughs> fuckers amongst this sea of red. And and corn's just like yeah, just fight. Just go ahead. You've got shit here of all sizes. You've got blood letters, you've got bloodthirsters, and everything in between. Just fight to your heart's content. And there they lay, being revived every day to fight for all eternity. It's orc fucking heaven, yo. It's orc yep. paradise. Yep. The little orcs that could fucking. And, I, and I, I just imagine, you know. <clears throat> And any other chaos god asking like corn like what, what, what's up with these green bastards yeah. he just goes like I, I just i just think they're neat that is um, neat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so rewinding that a bit to when like you and red were going like oh yeah the fucking eye of terror that's where we're going boys mm -hmm. the only thing that popped into my fucking head was um that scene from wallace and gromit a grand day out where they're out of cheese they look up to the moon and they go <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> That's where all the cheese is from. 
<laughs> that's the only thing that Jim demands is orcs just going, uh, and the fucking eye of terror. And then we'll get him like gradually more excited. Like, <laughs> like if, that's what we're order for you tonight, boys. <laughs> like, Let's go. <laughs> if someone could collectively tell all of the orcs at once that that's where it is, that's where it's at. The orc problem would cease to be a problem because they would all just, <laughs> yep. they'd all just, I mean, I'm sure corn would become infinitely more powerful than he already is, but. Oh, Christ. But still, <laughs> well, like, shit, the, they the, would be the feeding orc- Gorka Morka. What are you talking about? Yeah, oh, yeah. oh, my God. So, yeah, the, the, the orc issue just disappears into the warp quite literally. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nothing wrong with that because they're all having a good time. They're having such That's a great are. time and no one they has are. to, you know. I love how that kind of shows they can't really be corrupted by chaos either. They just sort of mutually exist in chaos, yeah. benefiting. <laughs> they, they didn't get mutated. They didn't get corrupted. They don't worship him. They're just like, fuck it, we fight hey, in. On top of that, yeah, on top of that orcs grow bigger the more they fight. Oh, yeah. there's some crocs in there, boys. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> eventually, they're going to get so far. And quarks are so goddamn powerful that they shook the warp with how they fought. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Maybe. eventually, you know, we might and and plus fucking orcs when they die they release spores, so they might have been releasing spores in Corn's domain. <laughs> so soon the, Korn might the have an implications, orc infestation. My God, the implications of an orc war just perpetually existing in the realm of Corn are monumental. We're gonna get to like M forty three. And just this green, these green, this green horde of Primarch-sized orcs are all just going to flood out, you know, with with corn's deceased corpse just around, just <laughs> dragged, dragged by, by the ankles from the rock, <laughs> like corn's all <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> He just he, he drags Tusk and his boys into his domain. Fast forward like ten thousand years, uh, and it just gets to the point where they're like crawling on him like ants. And I'm like, I'm sick of these fucking guys. I'm sick of these fucking. I can bitches. just oh I can God. just hear Zinch saying to Slanesh like or Nurgle like, I told him this would happen. I told him if he kept them around. So, uh, Moots, you know your casual chaos thing. Yeah, yeah. There's there's something here, man. There's, yeah, something, there's something here for that man. Corn wakes up in the middle of the morning, like in in the morning, walks up to like go get some cereal, opens a cabinet, and just fucking like a horde of green, tiny, like ant like orcs <laughs> just like fucking like yeah. fall on him. He's like, ah, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, me, me oh, God, and Red, the, the, the fucking chaos house is fucking infested. First we have the fucking we have Malal living in the damn cellar. We have now we have the fucking uh, Tusk and his uh, boys, Tusk and his boys, and al- also the, the Skaven, f- as well. Skaven as well. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> they, they, have, they have a serious pest problem. <laughs> like Slash walks around a corner, they sees Corn like in a puddle of his own blood, like reaching out, going run, and she's like, "You planted grass," and then suddenly all the orcs go that one there, and they just all start swarming. <laughs> <laughs> Get him, boys. Get him, boys. <laughs> they fucking turn the fridge into a gargan. <laughs> there we go. That's hilarious. Well, just, just for the uh, audience, because we need to tell, we need to say this just in context. Casual chaos is you can find it on Tumblr if you look hard enough. Oh, is, uh, and Instagram as well. Is a series mm. Moots worked on a few years ago that is on hiatus, but not over. I refuse to believe mm-hmm. it's finished. <laughs> um, where essentially. The four chaos gods to a, a kooky a sitcom flat share, ostensibly. Uh, yep. And yeah, just just that. It's Silly, goofy. It's silliness fun. ensues. I was talking to Red that the other day about the possibility of like a sort of comic strip sort of deal with just us doing random shit out and about. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, that, that could tie <laughs> in with the casual chaos stuff every now and again. Um, that could be quite fun to cross over with random shit. Um, God, I. I I have, I never knew my self insert into uh, a casual chaos would just literally be me. Because <laughs> 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 the thing is, I could just be like getting driven around in a plague bus cooler in like a traffic jam. <laughs> this whole other idea me and Red had doing the trip about uh, the lion and his road rage activities. Um, <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> and there's the fucking Mastodon driver parking anywhere he wants. Um, right, gentlemen. That's a whole other story. <laughs> Or I, I just need to add another thing about the whole uh, fucking orc infestation by defeat of uh, uh, corn. Does that mean that 
Corn officially, like canonically, has uh, foot fungus. <laughs> Holy uh, fuck! Why did you ever say that? <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit! I don't <laughs> like that. What the fuck? <laughs> yo, that's yo, that's <laughs> fucking what the? F- <laughs> that's irrefutable. <laughs> that's irrefutable. <laughs> that's irrefutable. That's irredeemable moods. <laughs> right, gentlemen, let's move on to the next one. So, this one was suggested by Moots. Uh, I can't pronounce his name, so I'm just going to try and pronounce it how I think it's spelt. It's Moots, Moots has given to us Teus becoming a Primaris at the end of the Devastation of Baal. Now, I have not done any stuff on the Devastation of Baal. I know all the footnotes, uh, hopefully without fungus. Moots, would you like, <laughs> would you like to uh, give, us, give us some information on Teus becoming a Primaris at the end of the Devastation of Baal and why it's so wholesome? Well, yeah, sure. So, unfortunately, the story leading up to uh, him becoming a primary is not entirely wholesome. Um, so, basically, he Fuck was that. a Blood boy. Angel's dying. Uh, I think that's pretty fucking wholesome. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. Hell, yeah, brother. Uh, well, there's a bunch of that in Devastation of Ball, I can tell you. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, he was a boy uh, on Ball Secundus who attempted the trials of the Blood Angels. Uh, unfortunately, by something called, uh, um, if I remember correctly, called like Angel Falls or the, something like that. Um, basically, a place where the kids had to use like gliding glide wings to jump from like a high uh, altitude and then just fly, like just glide for days until they reach uh, like uh, like a safe. Sp- a spot to land. Um, basically, he did that. Jesus uh, Christ! He jumped. Yeah, let's give a bunch of fucking miners gliders and have them in the air, like thousands of feet in the air. <laughs> what great guys these blood angels are! G- g- genius. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and but basically, he he did the jump, but uh, uh, f- failed and fell down and was left brain damaged and. Uh, um, was rejected from uh, like partaking in the uh, becoming an angel, obviously. Um, but so the, what the, what is wholesome in itself is the moment in question where at the end of the devastation of Baal, when um, his father, who has been partaking in uh, the defense of the uh, citadel of uh, the 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 chapter monastery of the blood angels um, has been mortally wounded. He's been infected with some tyranid parasite and is going to die. Uh, but uh, his uh, uh, his um, th- there's this apothecary, uh, Primaris uh, Marine, who uh, no, not Primaris, uh, or maybe he is a who comes to him and says. Uh, like scanning his son and says, um, there is a way, like we can turn your son into a Primaris uh, after all, and that would heal him of his injuries and uh, l- make him whole again in a way. Uh, and so, right before uh, Uyghur, as his father is called, uh, is about to be mercy killed by the Space Marine. Uh, Tius uh, asks his father if he's proud of him, upon which uh, Ugui, uh has this like reflection about how terrible he has been as a father and how he regrets uh, how he has treated his son and how he is but how he is proud and happy for his son who lost so much but who would now become the man he knew he would have been had it not been for his injury and so he just lets go of all his hate for and his resentment for the blood angels uh and uh, like uh, as Lisa starts asking for forgiveness uh, for his son as his neck gets snapped and uh, uh Theus goes on to be inducted into the uh, Blood Angels, and uh, there is actually a small mention of him in uh, the book afterwards, Darkness and the Blood, uh, and a short story entailing his first days as a Primaris Infiltrator Marine investigating a ship infested by gene stealers. It's uh, it's it's just a beautiful little story, I guess. I I just remember when I read that I was. You know, I was always feeling bad for Tius about uh, 
his uh uh, you know, for the way he was treated, and it's 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 vindication, I guess. It's uh, you know, they use that word. <laughs> Not from <laughs> the angels. You understand <laughs> me? <laughs> oh, oh jeez, I'm sorry. You fucking no fuck. <laughs> Please don't flay me. <laughs> uh, but no, it's it, yeah. is, it is interesting. It, it is very interesting. I think it's a good example of, of what happens when you you know we were talking about it earlier with the space marines and the, you know how space marines are just emotionally stunted, but given opportunities to actually be themselves and feel their emotions and have those emotions be on show and all this other stuff when you read the books uh or certain novels you really do get to see that space marines are not we, we see it a lot with the homebrew chapters that because obviously you know if you're if you're listening to this you probably know that we do a lot of homebrew stuff on the discord and a lot of the channel a lot of the discord revolves around homebrewing uh and one of the things that that we miss out on is seeing this side of space marines because you can only ever see this in in narratives you know you can only ever see it in short stories and actual full written stories um so yeah no that's wholesome as shit uh gentlemen uh we are at an hour and 20 odd minutes uh at least uh, at least mine it might be we might be behind that in the actual video of the podcast Mm. just because obviously stuff will get cut out but I would like to move on to the next few, maybe speed through the last uh, however many. Well, maybe not speed through, but certainly pick up the pace a wee bit if we can. Mm, That's fine. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next one uh, was actually kind of from Aaron. And it's a really good one that I wish I thought about sooner. It actually, it actually sort of comes back to the Salamanders a little bit. Now, Aaron put a mm. thing in our little suggestions thing when we were talking about this, saying, oh, what about that one Salamander successor? And what he was referring to is a salamander successor known as the dragon spears. And what the dragon spears do is, these boys. when possible, if a dragon spears space marine dies, they will actually take his body after the apothecary is done with it, and they'll eat him and his fucking brains. And the reason being <laughs> is when they do that, they all whoever partakes in the eating gains fragments of that space marine's memories and so the idea is that to an extent I mean, it's not a perfect science but to an extent space marines of the dragon spears always live on and it's just this it's it's not done for tactical reasons they don't do this for some i mean i'm, I'm sure that maybe the instances like that would pop up where some vital memory is helpful but mm, they don't it's more do, like ritualistic which is cool well it's it's uh, in reverence you know mm. they do, yeah. they do it to show respect they do it as a i mean i can imagine to most outsiders even to other space marines this would be abhorrent but to them it's so, it, it's a great honor to be able to partake in the eating of an old friend yeah because the sons of malice did the same thing and look what happened to them <laughs> well <laughs> you know <laughs> Uh, right, tonight, lads, we're eating the chapter master. It's a five course meal. <laughs> <laughs> he was a fat man. <laughs> How calorie dense are Space Marines? Pretty How dense. Mm. It's pretty dense, yeah. Mm. Um, <laughs> do you think it's gamey? Probably. <laughs> Probably. Um, I'd, I'd like to mention. Perfect for the bulk season. <laughs> <laughs> Space Marine, forty bazillion <laughs> calories. Um, <laughs> but I'm I'm not a huge fan of like the nineteen Space Marine organs that they get. That some some of them are really silly in my opinion, like the acid spit and stuff like that. But this was a really cool, wholesome use of the fucking omophagia. Sounds like someone um, who's never one seen how effective the... spitting acid in an enemy's face is. It's, it's just unnecessary, in my opinion. But um, sounds like one... someone in acid spitting range. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a fair point. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the Omophagy is a cool one because it, it allows memory retention, and this is a really wholesome sort of nice ritualistic use of it that makes sense. It's it's one of the reasons they'd have it is for of like vast tactical knowledge and shit like that. You got to wonder though how that ritual came about in the first place. Mm. Yeah. You know, that's going to be equal levels of daft to the, the man who like milked the first cow. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. well, no, like space brains, they they they're brought up with an already uh, uh, a knowledge that that organ exists within them. So I'm gonna guess that um, during some fucking campaign, a guy got his squad members killed and was so 
like attached to them that he didn't want their memories to die with them so he decided to um go into bulk season right then and there <laughs> <laughs> and then he brought back the news to his chapter going hey guys what if we didn't let the people die and everyone's like what the fuck are you talking about and the chapter was like hold on let him cook <laughs> <laughs> we eat the brains and we get their memories and then the chapter master's like hmm that's a bit that shit fucking insane but I like where your head's at <laughs> I never liked Codex Compliancy anyway. You know what? <laughs> because it's so out there and it's such a ritualistic thing, I, you know, I, and obviously the Apothecarian has to do its work first. So it's like, it must be a case of like, instead of yeah, just, oh, I'm on the battlefield. Like, I'm bibs and forks and knives. Yeah, yeah right so it's, like it's on a table. He's like, hold on, let me get the fucking ginseng first. <laughs> you know, uh, maybe there's like seasoning or something. I don't fucking know. Like... <laughs> Maybe, maybe they like actually. Maybe there's like, oh my god, the dragon spears must have one unique motherfucker whose entire existence revolves around knowing how to properly cook and prepare space marine oh, brains. No, oh, we got the grub master. Yeah, the <laughs> fucking yeah, man. He's he, he's the chaplain, but he moonlights as the chef. He like, is. <laughs> what, what makes that quite funny is because um, the dragon spears are like super elite. Uh, vet orc hunters. They have they fight almost mm. primarily orcs all the time, so they're always just fighting fungus and plants, so they probably just take a little bit from that, throw it in there, experiment <laughs> a little bit, you know what? <laughs> Today we have we have Brother Maximus uh, served with a sautéed mushroom side. <laughs> <laughs> you literally can yeah. Where'd you get the mushrooms? Worry. Don't worry about it. Uh, uh, it just makes me think of that fucking... Uh, uh, seen by Alpha Busa, the where where uh, what's that one uh, Blood Angel chapter who starts eating or how, how the flesh terrors were formed? Oh, uh, is that is that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Like, they, they eat. Then they start they, they eating. Eat, it. They, they just eat orcs and they go on. A, they they start tripping. Oh. It's it's really interesting though because in the um in the in the first in the how to homebrew loyalist space marines video I I mentioned that gene seed is not important to I mean it can be but it doesn't have to be and so I said that gene seed was not important to a chapter's culture or a chapter's sort of attitude personality collective personality etc uh, and I referenced a uh, I referenced that there there are chapters from X gene seed who act more like Y gene seed. And, and I actually specifically said, you know, we have examples of at least a single salamander's chapter that behaves more like a space wolf's chapter. And and that is actually the dragon spears. In fact, the dragon spears actually, I can't remember why, but the dragon spears actually owe an oath to the space wolves, which they fulfilled in a particular <clears throat> crusade or something. And, and, and so, you know, again, it sort of adds to that when you're making your own chapter, you don't have to be restricted to the, the caricature of the gene seed you know you can have your salamanders and you can make them eat their brother's brains and act like space wolves <laughs> you know yeah i mean the dark krakens is a fun one to look at which is also a salamander successor oh yeah but they are the complete opposite they are subnautical marines that fight sea monsters on their ocean planet world oh. I mean, actually here's a fun one as well one of the things that and this i i shouldn't say it annoys me because there are plenty of homebrews that fall into this trap and some of them are pretty good, so I'm not going to say I'm not going to say any names. But some of them, some of them are pretty good, some of them are a bit. Yeah. But there's a thing that these there's a thing that a lot of people do when the homebrewing salamander successes that annoys me a little bit. When so you know how salamanders have this caricature of being super friendly, right? Mm, mm. None of their successes share that shit. Mm. You know, no, there's no precedent for salamanders' successes to be as friendly as the salamanders. That's just not something that happens. Um, and so if you make a homebrew and you want your homebrew to be friendly towards civilians and you're thinking, oh, well, I'm going to make them salamanders, yada, yada, just know that like you, that there's no precedent for that. You know, you, that's not a particularly grand way of going. You can do it. Of course you can do it. You can do fucking anything. Yeah. You, know, you can you know, do what you want. Do you, do, I'm not your dad. Do what the fuck you want. You know, we're, good. we're not your dads. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, Moots might be. Yeah. He gets around a bit. It might be. Moots might. I don't fucking know. <laughs> But that's the thing. If you if you want to use that really lovely trope of your space marines giving a little bit more of a shit about civilians, 
don't have to be salamanders. Do, it could be any of them. Do whatever you want, man. You know. Just on the opposite side of that, what successor chapter are the Marines Malevolent from? No one knows. Know. Oh. We don't even know who the chapter master is. We have no idea. Ah. Uh, In fact, actually, that's a fun one. Uh, Something I noticed recently when I was doing reading on Badab, almost, I'd say about half, if not more than half, of the chapters present at Badab, we don't know where their gene seed comes from. Because this was in a time Mm. when GW's writing was a lot more comprehensive. I was going to say more comprehensive about the core Mm. of what makes Space Marine stories special. And at that point in time, in like the early 2000s, Gene seed wasn't that important like it is today to people. It was like, no, it doesn't matter what the gene seed is. They're fucking space marines, and this is what they do. Which is why there's only rumors about the Carcharodons, the Minotaurs, the Marines Malevolent, etc. You know, we don't know where the gene seed of the Astral Claws comes from. We don't know where the gene seed of... I think the Star Phantoms. I could be wrong on a few of these. So don't don't lynch me. But the, the, the general idea, you know, the general idea back then was that no, no, Gene Seed's not that fucking important. It really isn't. A character's personality is defined by their culture and their experience. You know, you don't need to. I'm, I'm ranting about homebrews again. I shouldn't. This isn't even a fucking homebrew <laughs> video. You don't need to. Le- you don't, don't use Gene Seed as a crutch. You can do the thing been regardless for about of Gene Seed. Eight minutes. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Let's move on. Let's move hey, on. So guys, the next one. Let's speed through these next ones. Proceeds to rant about homebrews for eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm good like that. Right. Save it for the standard form, you fucker. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I curse you with frontal lobe collapse. Enjoy your dementia, Tom. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. I am do think bad. So the next one is Garviel Loken and his friends. We actually touched upon Garviel Loken earlier. This guy's a fucking G. Yes. I think this one was yours, Moots. He it was. has a well, isn't one of his close friends or was uh, a remembrancer? Yes. He was well, yes, a poet exactly. that stirred up some shit. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately Definitely. committed suicide <laughs> under dubious means. <laughs> Are you talking about? Um, I'm talking about the, the 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 lady who is also who is always referred to as very tall and has a dark complexion. The one that met Horus. Oh no! The, uh, uh, by the no, way, there are two no, separate remembrancers. Garvey Loken oh, uh, had his own oh, remembrancer. Yes. I don't remember what her name was, but yes, I know what you're talking about. He had another one. I I read the book, and he was a cool character. I don't. He had. There, that lady was just a, a, a cart, not a cartographer, but she just cataloged his stories and talked in her uh, about his war stories. I think Horace referred to her as a documentarist or something yeah, like that. Yeah, Horace had his own documentarist mm. that he snapped her neck. Um, he illuminated I s- her. I swear um, the guy you're thinking about is a preacher. He's not a preacher. The, the, no, he, but he actually, didn't. He, he do like a, a whole no, sermon he, at the, near the start of Horus Rising after the after they killed the uh, after they killed the fake emperor guy. Yes, he, he did. did he, he, yeah, we're thinking about the same guy. He yeah. was a um, what was he? They called him something specific. I'm googling it. I need to know. It's bugging me. Anyway, I always imagine that character <laughs> being played by uh, um, Picard. Who's the guy that plays Picard? Fuck oh, uh, Patrick Stewart. Uh, yeah, I always imagine yeah. him being played by Patrick Stewart if they ever. <laughs> oh, that's actually really good. Patrick anyway, Stewart's so that, fucking that, old now. He anyway, do it anyway so there's, well. a, there's a guy who was a poet, and he was kind of like a guy that didn't really. I had questions about the validity of the moral justifications of the Imperium. So he yeah. wrote some, like, quote-unquote slanderous poems about, like, the nature of the Crusade. Yeah. And, you know, he ended up, like, stirring some shit, and Garville himself went down, fucking went down to his apartments when this guy was in deep shit, ripped out a page of his book, wrote down an oath a moment, and said, this is an oath a moment. Take it. Uh, take it. And so he, he did, like, all right, you continue doing exactly what you were doing, but bring your stuff to me first, and we can work through this to make it a little less damaging to you. Because uh, Garville oh, uh, cared so much about like the image of Marines and wanted yeah. he wanted to be like a symbol of righteous imperial truth. So he worked with this poem poet guy to work in like the ugly truth of the crusade to try and get people to understand that sometimes you know war is fucking awful and marines have to do these things in order to secure a brighter future for the imperium it's it's cinderman by the way cinderman yes i think we might have folded two characters into one because carol cinderman is the primary iterator but the poet is ignis uh Karkazi, both in the mm, same story yes. so I, I think we i think we've turned cinderman and Karkazi into the same character no 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 i, I, I no, knew no, exactly no. who i was no, no. talking about you're the one that got confused yeah yeah anyway there's also like the Garvey Loken was basically the protagonist for much of the first books. 
he was yes. um, basically like a very stern, morally righteous character. He was almost an imperial fist. Now that I think about it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, a lot of it was that he he didn't believe himself to be truly human. He was one of those marines, but so a lot of people noise in the background. Don't worry about him. Um, <laughs> But a lot of it was him questioning, like, how how emotionless Marines truly are. He had a lot of questions about, like, their nature as these transhuman beings. And he went around, he talked to humans, he joked with them sometimes, even in, like, his very bland, mm. like, clean-cut way. Yeah. But all in all, Garville Loken was probably one of the best Marines there. Mm. Yeah. Well, the, the, as, as we see in the, in the books, he is, like... In the beginning, he is very like stoic and uh, very serious, but uh, he does end up like catching some like people off guard with his jokes. Uh, among them, like the uh, the Morneval, uh and things like that. Yeah. I, I can't remember the scene exactly, but there there is one where uh, he uh, he he makes a fool of uh, one of uh, one of the Morne- other Morneval members when he catches him off guard with a joke. It uh, was uh, Little Horus. Yeah. Little Horus. Uh, oh, no, yeah, 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 Little Horus. Yeah, Aximan, yeah. I always imagine Little Horus. I know he's called Little Horus, but when I picture him in my in my mind's eye, I just I don't imagine him being the height of a space marine. I really don't. No. I imagine he's a Maximian Voss sort of character, like a space marine, but also a dwarf. Well, well, actually, same here. I've always envisioned him as like the the, the short stack. He's, of space he's actually marine. like a, a one for one look of like actual Horus, which is why everyone calls him Little yeah. Horus. So he's, it's not yeah. because he's little; yeah. it's because he looks like Horus. But because he's got uh, this thing, as as the heresy goes on and as Aximan's character devolves. He he does end up, I, I mean, I, uh, this is just my opinion, but he always comes off as a character with little man syndrome. No, no, he's and actually, so he's actually insanely he's, depressed all the time. Well, yeah. Did he get more or less depressed sure. after um, that white scar cut his face off? Oh, way more. <laughs> <laughs> Stage five. Stage five depressed. <laughs> Since I'm not a big law guy, I haven't heard about this guy until like recently. So I thought this was some sort of new joke going around. I didn't realize this guy was an actual thing oh, no. called Little Horus and all this shit. He has a really cool <laughs> fucking sword. His it looks sword, like the Moonlight great sword. It, yeah, I was about to say, it looks like the Moonlight Greatsword. It's so cool. Mm. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> um, but going back to... Um, there's... Um, uh, during the time when they were trying to get Euphrates Keen off the vengeful spirit, Euphrates Keen being the first Imperial Saint. Yeah. Um, mm. Uh... It was um, Garfield went to uh, 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 one of the other Marines who was called the Half Herd because he's a very old Marine, like one of those Marines that looked old. And everyone thought he was like, oh, he's the dementia ridden grandpa. But in reality, this guy knew exactly what was happening around him. And so oh, he, asked this Marine, he, asked the, he asked the Half Herd if he can help him. And, and the Half Herd, without, without dropping a beat, said, yes, I will. Like, this, this is wrong. We need to do this. So <laughs> he actually sequesters <laughs> away Euphrates Keen and uh, Garville's uh, Remembrancer and the main uh, Ill- Illustris. Um, what is his name again? Cinderman. Uh, Cinderman. Cinderman. Yeah. And, yeah. like, he actually ends up dying to, like, some Justinian, but he, like, heroically defended them to get them off. God, that, see, that's that's something that um, Games Workshop do quite a lot. And I, I'm going to remember some, some other fucking assholes named in a minute, the, the authors, where they'll make a side character and shroud them in a fair chunk of mystery and then just have them be a fucking G. I remember the, <laughs> the Black Shields... <laughs> A squad of black shields fought a- Abaddon as Abaddon uh, landed on Terra with his Terminators. And Abaddon got fucked, by the way, in the Siege of Terra. <laughs> Abaddon got fucked. Um, yep. But there was this really off, there's this offhand character we know almost nothing about. Well, not almost nothing. I think in a few of the other books we learn a little bit about him. But he's a black shield world eater. Mm, my favorite. And this guy just fucking rages at Abaddon and tries to kill him. I think he just ends up getting he ends up getting stabbed in the fucking head. And it's just so cool how like <laughs> there's so many just random out of pocket characters like like this this the half herd as well, who we get very little about, but what little we get just gives us all the characterization we need, you know? Yeah. 
the uh, the idea is like not a lot of quantity, but all quality. My kind of trope. Oh Fuck, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. It's the le- it's less is more. You know, it yep. is less is more. And I think I'm going to talk about home ruin again. Less is more. <laughs> less is more. <laughs> anyway, so, so uh, shall we talk? There's one that I chucked in here that I'm probably just going to make Red talk about because Red certainly knows more about it than I do. And that's near the end of the uh, omnibus, uh, the Night Lord's omnibus, uh, the lovable, uh, murderous, wonderful, murderous Talos. Does, <laughs> ha- he has two slaves, right? <laughs> and if I recall correctly, his All two right. slaves... Septimus and Octavia. And his two slaves, they're a couple, right? Mm-hmm. They, and they, they have a kid, or, they're, or, they're, or, one, of them's, or one of them's pregnant. Yeah, Octavia's and pregnant. When Talos is like, yeah, I'm going to fucking die on this next battle, guys... Not only does he fucking free them, but he gives them a little bit of warning as to like what not to do or what to do, so that they've got their be- best odds of being able to get out of there with their, you know, their new family. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's like this is coming from again. This is all these tropes about night lords. They're true, but in a fucking vacuum, you know. Yeah. Because um, you can see even Talos, this kind of guy who saw his mother get fucking bolt rounded to the face, and he was like, "Oh, all right, I didn't know." Um, but these two slaves, these two serfs that had basically served him for however many years, he's he he entertains what they have to say. He doesn't beat the fuck out of them. He certainly doesn't skin them. And when but he's he like, "Yeah, beat guys," the fuck out of Septimus at one point. Yeah, well, I'm sure Septimus <laughs> earned it. Um, <laughs> he impregnated Octavia. And she was the navigator, oh. so he was kind of upset. Uh, I mean, that's kind of that kind of checks out. I wouldn't want my navigator getting up the duff, but. Um, <laughs> 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 but, I'm sorry. Um, God damn. But it's, you know, it's it's again these small bits of characterization that give degrees of humanity to even the most lost space marines like Talos. You know, and he knew he was going to die. Well, he didn't know, but he was like, "Yeah, I'm probably going to fucking die." And so I was like, "You guys, just get out of here. Just do what you can. Get the fuck out of here." A large portion of Talos's story is is this um to be um. It actually lingers on the idea that Talos himself is still morally righteous, even as a night lord. Like his entire thing is that he wanted to be a hero. He yeah. still believes the Legion to be as glorious as a lot of a, a night lords still perceive it to be. Yeah, he, he's kind of naive in that regard. So um, a, a, a big portion of his story is him spending like a lot of time morally justifying himself. I mean, he's not like trying to go this like I'm doing what is right. No, he 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 be- genuinely believes in what he believes in. Um, but as far as a night lord goes, he is probably one of the more nicer ones. He, yeah. when they dock in Hell's the Hell's Iris, where the Red Corsair's um, space station is, he tells yeah. all the slaves not to leave the ship because compared to the the ones on the spaceship, the night lords were saints. Oh. He warned them that they mm. would get murder fucked at the fucking Hell's Iris. Um, yeah. and that God, it's probably it's... best for their own safety to stay in there. I mean, he probably just did it so he doesn't have to go track down more slaves, to be honest. But like <laughs> pragmatic. <laughs> he still he he was pragmatic about it, but it's still he he's like, I need to warn the people before, you know, bad shit happens and we're fucking down yeah. a couple of slaves. Yeah. I mean, there's another point in the book where um Night Lords have this coin. And this coin says Av Domnus Nox, and it uh, has the etching of a Marine's name on it. And whoever possesses that coin is oath-bound by that Marine for that Marine to protect them. And it's kind of a way to save their artificers and people to um, not be killed by other Night Lords. Or when they do get killed, they see that coin and the person that killed them is like, oh, I'm fucked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but a mistake Septim- was made on this day. Septimus, Talos' artificer, um, gave this coin to something called the Voidborn, which is the only child to be born on a Night Lord ship. And she was like a good luck charm for the slave community down there. And so he gave it to her as kind of like um, a little thing he did behind Talos' back because he, he wanted to protect the child. And he was hoping, and he knows Talos is an honorable man as far as honor goes with Night Lords. <laughs> Night Lords, yeah. Yeah. And so later on, Talos reveals that he found out about it like almost immediately. And was joking with, like, they defiled a legion relic, Septimus. She <laughs> drilled a hole through it. And so Septimus is sweating bullets now, like, oh, fuck. But he's like, uh, you might as well pick Syrian's coin just so you're protected because I'm resigned to protecting a child. <laughs> and so they don't do anything about it. Tom's like, oh, fuck, fine, whatever. 
<laughs> and unfortunately, um, spoilers, the book's been out for a while. The child meets an unfortunate end at the hands of a fucking blood angel by you, by the way. God, those fucking blood angels, man. God and damn. Anyway, uh, so the, she, gets, guys. she gets vivisected by a blood angel chain sword. And so, you know, this causes a lot of ru- uh, uproar in the slave community. Like, the child died, the ship's cursed, we're all fucked. Talos takes the time out of his fucking busy life to go hunt down that specific <laughs> blood angel and murder fuck him to non-existence just because he killed the child that he was supposed to protect. God, blood angels, <laughs> man. God, blood angels get so much fucking praise, but these guys are just... Mm. They're not good. For, they're I mean, not all they good. are space vampires. Yeah, yeah I mean, they're but, Marines. Marines are not good guys. They're not good guys. No, they're not good guys. Sanguinius not. might have been a good guy. But it's, it, I mean, you say that about the Blood Angels, and it does do a sort of a quick harken back to what the Blood Angels were like without Sanguinius, prior to oh, Sanguinius. Yeah. The Blood Angels prior to mm. Sanguinius oh, yeah. were more world eater than the world eaters ever were. Yeah. <laughs> they were known as the Revenants. I mean, that's just the revenants. That's not a good. That's that's not a good gang of people. No. You, you don't want to mess with it. the revenants. That's not a good name. Prior to Sanguinius, <laughs> I mean, we, we look at the Thousand Sons during the Heresy and during the Great. So during the Great Crusade, and the White Scars during the Great Crusade, and you look at them like outcasts. There will never be a Space Marine Legion or chapter that was more outcast than the pre-Sanguinius Blood Angels. No one wanted anything to fucking do with them. I cannot imagine the spine crunching maneuvers bending backwards Sanguinius must have done to get them into shape. You know? <laughs> Anyways, gentlemen. Oh, definitely. L- <laughs> let's have uh, let's take a, a, a move on. We've got two left. And so this la- this next one, I believe, was Moots. Uh Yes. Angron using his psychic oh. powers to soothe a child to take said child's pain into him. Oh, my boy, my beautiful boy. If you don't know, I love Angron. And this is just pre-Butcher Snail's Angron when he still had his um, Primark psychic power. Oh, can't can't have a wholesome moment it. in 40k without an undertone of pure fucking tragedy. And yep. I'm entirely unaware of the psychic shenanigans Angron has. So oh. I'm get very curious. Well, get fucking educated on Aaron. Uh, Fuck you, right? My brain's <laughs> the size of a fucking Citadel paint pot. <laughs> um, no, but so basically, it's it's not super long, but just Angron's power manifests once. I can't remember what book it is. Someone in the comments will tell me. Uh, the book cover has his dog there, by the way. Right, yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, also a good boy. Engron had an uh, average-sized and- pit bull. <laughs> <laughs> it was called Princess. <laughs> it was beautiful. Um, but basically, his psychic powers was simply uh, being a pure empath. He would, he could take hmm. um, the pain and like guilt and uh, just uh, bad emotions of other people. And take them into him. He he could literally remove their anxieties and their fears and their anger and their uh, sadness. And there, so in in this scene in the book, uh, I, I I am br- the brain rot is hitting me hard right now. But uh, it is <laughs> there's someone essentially, yeah there's someone's laying on the a cot like after a battle or something. And it was a young child, probably like in their teens, and Angron's like adoptive father was watching him as Angron placed his hand upon this, like, um, traumatized boy, and slowly the boy calmed down significantly. Oh, I thought it was a girl. Oh, Was it a girl? Just, it was someone. I don't fucking care. I don't like kid. Angron. Yeah. It was a kid. It was a kid. It was someone yeah. who was not feeling well that day. It, exactly. Their tummy Fair was enough. hurting. Fair enough. But this, this I mean, but this is it, you know, we, we talk about a bunch of other entries and how they all end in tragedy, but nothing in 40k will ever end in tragedy quite as much as uh, the fate of Angron, because... What do you mean? I mean he gets to go to the corn gym and see the crocodile. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I somehow... Not a good thing. I, the, the Angron's fucking dog got reincarnated as the crocodile. <laughs> Look, yeah. Angron's just a man with his dog, all right? <laughs> He's literally like, I don't know if you've watched that fucking that that like podcast that uh, John Bertinal did 
And he's just talking about him and he's like, yeah, man. And he's like, like, before he got married, he's like, yeah, man, it was just me and my dog. And that's just him. <laughs> Angron is just John Burt now and his, and his dog. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but, 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 but before Corn, it was just me and my dog. Just my me dog. and the dog. <laughs> His name's but Princess. It's like a little silly drawn crocodile. It's just a photorealistic crocodile in a perfectly, like, one of your art style style things. And it's, my boy! My boy! No! <laughs> Do we ever find out what happened to Angron's dog? Um, he, uh, it went to the farm, Tom. It went to the farm. No, oh, oh, no. <laughs> no. Okay, fair enough. Anyways, so uh, next one. This was Aaron's um, suggestion. I, I don't even like the guy. Uh, but it's also this is. <laughs> I, 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 I think this is a goofy suggestion, but there might be some credence to it. So let's discuss about per, quote Perturabo's toy making. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta say, I'm, there's like a, an art piece of him doing that, but that's like fan art. I've read all the Protorobo books, and he's he's consistently a dick. The, the funny thing is, when you think about the, the Warhound Titan little thing he had, that was made by Vulcan. Protorobo didn't make that. He just tried to fix it. That was a gift from Vulcan. So again, Vulcan, the most wholesome man in the universe, everybody gives the, gives the most depressed... Um, self-righteous idiot a fucking toy to cheer him up canonically 40k Santa um, yeah, canonically 40k <laughs> black Santa yes the, there, there's also the um, uh, the little machine or spy glass kind of thing he makes Magnus in uh, Magnus the Red's uh, Primark book uh, but the thing is he also makes that specifically just so we can smash it to bits right in front of Magnus <laughs> just to prove a point such a wonderful guy <laughs> oh my god I'm in here oh my god <laughs> but 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 I, I still do think there there's some credence to it I mean he he did I think he did sort of like really like or slash like enjoy the uh, the, the little Warhound Titan. Like he he still held it to like a sort of esteem. Yeah, I even mean, if the, he showed it in he, his own weird way. His conversation with Fulgrim about the miniature Warhound Titan uh, was just a huge conversation where he shows off his respect for Vulcan's knowledge, the intricacies and the craftsmanship. Although yeah. it's kind of undercut a little bit when he kind of, you know, makes the Warhound Titan Fulgrim's face the same entity. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, there is that. I swear there was a big emphasis back when like Big E was roaming around when um Petrabo was trying to sort of explore a bit and he got pretty much demanded to make war machines instead of like trinkets and shit he was making. That was during his book Hammer of Olympia. His adopted father wanted to use Perturabo for his war capabilities That's and Perturabo wanted That's to build the... cities and peaceful shit. But at the same time, maybe he shouldn't have made a sword when he met him, so fuck him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hardest working primer could have heresy, though. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, still, oh, yeah. still canonically the Grinch, but yes. Big man. <laughs> <laughs> right, gentlemen, we have one left. One left. We're closing in on the two-hour mark, left. so let's do this last one. Now, this one was Oof. by Moots, and it was a... Instead of writing me a, a very short couple of words, he wrote a whole fucking complex sentence, so I will just read it out verbatim. <laughs> that one preacher in Hell's Reach who did the climbed down from his church on top of a titan and brought as much supplies as possible on his back to help the war-stricken civilians, and while other ecclesiarchs were out on the battlefield, he stayed inside of civilians and prayed with them, even telling sisters of battle to lower their weapons around them. Now, a quick fact about this guy before we go any further... He survived the Battle of Hell's Reach, and then yeah. and then died of a heart attack two weeks later. Oh. I'm, not, I'm not even joking. <laughs> <laughs> what a guy! <laughs> so the undertone of tragedy is never ending. Indeed. Well, it's I guess in in the grim darkness of the forty first millennium, it's uh, you know you have this very extreme image of. Uh, the of the religious of the ecclesiarchs of the people who uh preach about the emperor of mankind but the i don't know i i just don't feel like it was for me it was either between this and uh was it called jariah the uh the priest in uh, the last church 
Uh, oh, I, pro- pro- my God. I probably got his name. No, no, I think wrong. you got his name right. His name is Jiraiya. That's oh, that makes me sad hearing his name again. Yeah. Oh, that guy cooked. Um, no, he cooked, and he got cooked <laughs> in the church. <laughs> um, Man knew his wine, though. Yep, yep. And, like, the, these kinds of, I don't know, when you have all this extreme, when you have the, the horrible, the, like, all, all the bad shit, and then you just see what it's all meant to be, right? It's not meant to be the horrible oppressive bullshit of religion it's supposed to be about helping others and about uh, doing your yeah. best to uh, to to just help the community what Wait, the right? is that so- priest doing climbing from the time his best <laughs> his best <laughs> but it is so it's the uh, it's the unfiltered pure good faith optimism of religion and we can sit here and we can slander religion or we can support it It doesn't fucking matter but when you condense the goodness of religion and faith and how it's represented in 40k into a just you know a a condensed substance you do get things like this you get jiraiya's speech to the emperor and you get this one dickhead in hell's reach who he was totally safe he could have stayed in the titan he would have been yeah. fucking fine. I mean, Jesus Christ. But yeah. he went, now nah, I'm going to come down and I'm going to run around a battlefield giving people food. And I'm going to chat yep. shit to uh, these women who are about a foot taller than me and have muscles like Ronnie Coleman. You know? <laughs> and he did it to help people. He did it because it was the right thing to do. You know? Uh, yeah. And, and and that's that is one of the most, you know, the hopeful things about reading forty one of the best things, sorry, about reading forty K novels, because you don't just get to see the war and the badassery, you get to see the unfiltered hope of humanity. And I think yeah. there's few characters that can summarize it in such a condensed way, like this one preacher, you know? Yeah. And if that isn't wholesome as fuck then I don't know what No, you're right. Honestly. No, it is. It absolutely is wholesome. Uh, anyways, gentlemen, we have, at least in recording, I'm sure the final thing will be a bit less, reached the two-hour mark. Way! Way and boys. so, ladies and gentlemen, before we do our little outro, I do want to say thank you so much for sitting with us for two hours uh, on the 22nd of December when you could be sat stuffing your face <laughs> with whatever the, whatever the hell stuff you do just before Christmas. Uh, we all four of us. We all no, hope fuck, you have it's a, Christmas. It is Christmas. We all <laughs> hope you have a wonderful Christmas, a wonderful New Year's, mm-hmm. a wonderful mm-hmm. everything. Uh, I'm not. Go- we're not going to bother with the uh, the outro this time. I'm just going to do it all here, so we can fuck off and carry on with our evening because this will be a long recording, guys. I have mm. stuff to do. I'm, yes, I'm going to go do my <laughs> Santa-ly duties and put a oh, big oh, yeah. meal <laughs> in like, Tom's stocking. Oh, FYI, <laughs> I, we uh, might have had a, through a series of unfortunate events have killed Santa, so now we have to. <laughs> So now we have to do his job for him. Oh, yeah. Aaron's uh, yeah, doing... So now, Aaron's now take, we work. split down the work down the middle. Aaron's doing the nice list. I'm doing the naughty list, of course. So, <laughs> Joshua, I know what you did this yeah, year, and I gotta tell you, you ain't getting off light. All right? <laughs> Fucking prepare yourself, you little motherfucker. Oh, God. <laughs> and, 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 I have to, and I have to work overtime and making all these goddamn toys. Thank you very much, Red. <laughs> you guys the you got a bad idea. Have Maybe you seen a strange me? Each man in a red suit shouldn't be on the top of my fucking house. <laughs> you think you, think you guys have point. it bad? Have you seen me? Have you seen this motherfucker behind me? I gotta pull the sled with this motherfucker and ten thousand fucking presents <laughs> hey. in it. You think you got hey. it bad? <laughs> What the fuck do you mean by that, huh? What do you think I mean, you fat bastard? What the fuck do you think I mean? You ain't getting no fucking Big Mac now, son. You ain't getting nothing. No, right. Put him in the harness. (laughs) I'm going to start everyone. Good night. (laughs) If you like the podcast and want to see more, subscribe to our YouTube channel and maybe hit the like button. Oh, and don't forget to look up our other social media accounts on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And remember, don't commit any crimes or I'll come for you late at night. They have Dominus Knox. Knocks.